it seems like every time they smash the metals, uh, clearly 1,200 is what they're trying to cap on gold, and 16 is what they're trying to cap on silver. It's, it's been so blatantly obvious. You know? Yeah, but they can't keep silver below 16 right now. Well, I just think that that's going to be the one that may lead us out because it's it, it just is it's too small a market. And at some point, the smallness, which has helped them control it, is going to become their worst enemy. I agree. It's I think it's their Achilles heel, and that's why they're so aggressive about attacking it. Absolutely. Welcome to Shadow of Truth. Today is Thursday, April the 30th, 2015, with your host, Dave Kranzler from InvestmentResearchDynamics.com and Rory Hall from TheDailyCoin.org. And we have a very special guest today, Mr. John Embry, who is a senior executive with Sprott Asset Management. Hi, everyone. Rory, um, we're very fortunate that, that John agreed to come on to our show, and I'm looking forward to hearing his insights. Um, one of the topics I want to bring up is this idea of the death of cash. It seems like there's a movement amongst the central banks, and it's supported by a lot of, quote-unquote, Wall Street economists to convert our entire currency system into a digital-based electronic-generated currency system and outlaw actual cash currency. And the reason why I want to bring it up is John, I exchanged emails earlier this week with John and I hadn't really thought about it, put too much thought about it. And he asked my opinion on the whole situation and that's what got me thinking about it. So, um, I'd like to discuss that with John and, um, we can also bring up what's going on in the precious metals market, especially silver, because he's very bullish on silver. Hello. John, is that you? It is indeed. It's Dave Kranzler, and I got Rory Hall here with me. How are you doing? What a great pleasure to talk to you, Dave, after all these years. I know. Likewise, John. I've been looking forward to this all week. Well, I tell you, we picked a hell of a day, though, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to get to that second on the list, but since you brought it up, why don't why don't we talk about it? What, what do you make of this... Uh, this drive-by ambush on the precious metals about 30 seconds before the jobless claim was reported. They whacked gold for about close to $20 and they whacked silver. Silver was up as high overnight to 1673 and they whacked it down to 1580. So they took silver they down. They almost took a buck off the silver price. And you know? I mean, it's just par for the course. This sort of Blatant activity to me suggests that there's something even worse go behind the scenes than you and I think. It's just bizarre. It's just bizarre behavior. Well, it's interesting that you say that because um, I, I know you and I both, through communications with Bill Murphy, kind of independently mentioned to him around mid December that we had a feeling something's blowing up behind the scenes just from the way that they're they're trying to keep their foot on the precious metals. And it was right around mid-December, and that sort of ties into right around when the Fed's reverse repos with foreign institutions went parabolic. Yeah, that was a great piece of research in that uh, reverse repos because, I mean, I think it, told, it, it really told a lot. You want to throw out some ideas for what you think might be going on? Well, I think one of the great problems, and we've, I think a lot of people have recognized that they just don't want to really deal with it because it's it's – so difficult. And that's this whole issue of derivatives. All I can see is increasing volatility in the system. I mean, when you have the oil price, the largest traded commodity in the world, dropping in half in, in a very short period of time, you have talk about Greek exit from the euro and the volatility in the Greek bond market and just general volatility in the system. This is blowing a hole in derivatives. And I mean, given the how intrusive they are on the bank balance sheets, there has to be a problem that they're just trying to cover up. And uh, I think that may be the, the real issue. And speaking of derivatives, uh, John, do you remember uh, a few weeks ago that bank in Austria blew up? Yes, and, I do remember that well. And it blew up a bank about two weeks later over in Germany. Do you think that that is playing a part in what we're seeing right now? Without question. I think, you know, it's one of these things, like I'm a huge believer 
in Austrian economics. And when you reach a stage in an economic cycle where you can't add credit productively, then the problems start to manifest themselves. And what we can't sort of put our finger on is what is going to be the particular black swan that is finally going to tip this thing over. And it's frustrating because, you know, you, you, you have a strong feeling that you're right in your analysis, but you can't get sort of the final piece that's going to uh, sort of topple this over. Well, I, I think that that Austria bank has, is causing more problems than, than most people realize. I mean, I don't disagree with that at all. I mean, it's, it's ironic because the 1931 failure of an Austrian bank sort of got it rolling in that, in that cycle. Really? I didn't know yep. that. Yeah. Well, and it, I mean, it really kind of tells you just how massive the derivatives problem is. And, and they've done a great job at hiding the full scope of, of how big the derivatives market is from us. And I've I, always, I've always been of the view that um, part of the reason that, that Cyprus was bailed out bailed in and bailed out really was because it, if just even a small country like S Cyprus blows up, it's going to trigger the huge derivatives credit default daisy chain. And you just see massive counterparty default swaps. And well, I, go I ahead. Think they learned their lesson back in 2007 when they let somebody big, it was a counterparty go down. And they really had a hard time sort of stifling it. This time, they don't want to, you know, make the mistake of letting it get started. So I don't know how long this can continue, but it, it, it is frustrating. How can they contain it? Well, I don't think they can ultimately. I mean, it's just one Band-Aid on top of another. And at some point, it's going to rupture. We just don't know quite when. And I just think this, this frenetic activity that, that's in these markets, like I was just looking before we started chatting, there's some suggestion that the Japanese came in and, and you know put liquidity in and sort of suddenly the European or the German bonds started to recover and this U.S. stock market started to recover. They can't let anything get going on the downside and the collateral in the system, I don't think. And they will fight this. Till they, till they run out of ammo. I, I sort of came to the conclusion about a year ago that um, they may have that ammo until something causes the, the dollar to, if not collapse outright, depreciate it seriously in value. I think that's probably a pretty good analysis because certainly I mean, one of the major impacts in the last you know, six months has been this inordinate dollar strength, which I always characterize as rather than dollar strength, that's weakness in all the other currencies that make up the trade weighted dollar, but it still manifests itself as dollar strength and everybody sort of jumps up and down. Well, I'll tell you what's interesting about that is the dollar did the same thing in 2008 and it was, it was attributed to a scramble by predominantly European banking institutions scrambling for cash in order to keep paying their, their dollar-based liabilities because the asset side that was generating cash to fund those liabilities had gone down so much in value. And I have a feeling that's what we're seeing this time also. I mean, yeah, I don't I, I don't think there's any doubt. And I think it extends beyond the European scene. I think it's in, right into the third world. I mean, there's an awful lot of borrowing in American dollars globally. And then this strength in the American dollar just makes the problem that much worse. So there's just an awful lot of moving parts. And I must con confess, I've got to tip my hat. These guys have done one heck of a job holding together a situation that I think was ultimately fatal. But it, put it this way, I always like to say, I'd rather be playing my hand at this point than their hand. And it's just a matter of how long we're going to play. John, you and I are probably on the same page on this thought, but when I first started really diving into this sector back in 2001, and by the time I was kind of fully up the curve a couple years later, if you had told me that they would have been able to kick the can down the road this long, I would have said you're crazy. I mean, like you said, it's it's my hat's off to them for the job they've done at masterminding this. Well, it's interesting. I just was writing a piece for Investors Digest uh, yesterday, 
And I've been thinking about it a lot, why it's taken a lot longer than I would have guessed. And essentially, I've been wrong in timing, to put it mildly. But I think I underestimated the extent of financial innovation. I mean, we, we know all about the derivatives and the application of hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of derivatives to the system. But there's also like all the algorithms and the high frequency trading there's a lot of sort of developments that has allowed them to put more leverage and maintain more leverage in the system and therefore stretch it out. But unfortunately for society as a whole, there's a finite life to this. And I think we're getting closer and closer just by the frenetic action in the markets that suggests that's what's happening. I would agree with that. And I would also suggest that the collapse in the rule of law has helped them perpetuate it. I mean, it's if, if they were to enforce the laws and regulations onto the financial markets that are on the books now, that are already in place, they would have never been able to do this. And HFT trading would not be allowed. I mean, it, it, well, it's it, essentially front running. You're right. right. It creates a completely unlevel playing field, you know, both the HFT trading and the lack of rule of law. And that's, that's helped them immensely in kicking the can down the road. Well, you know, I, I guess, as you know, and I followed the gold and silver space for a long time, as you have. And I mean, I'm just absolutely appalled at the abuses in that state. But I understand why, because basically, if gold and silver actually reflected their true value, it would basically, uh, you know, create a problem in the sense that people would realize the current monetary policy is ridiculous, which it is. And uh, this whole thing would come to an end. Interest rates would have to go up. So they basically are manic in trying to control gold and silver prices. And I, I'm actually shocked they've been able to get away with it for four years. I mean, if you would have told me back in 2011 when gold hit 1900 and earlier silver approached 50 bucks that they'd be at these levels today in view of what's transpired in the real world, I would have said absolutely impossible. But they've done it, and it, they've had to skirt the law to do it, but they've gotten away with it. It's funny. I was just discussing that exact thing yesterday with, with a colleague of mine. So um, we can circle back on silver because I want to get your, your market outlook for it. But um, I just wanted to touch really briefly on this idea of the death of cash because, quite frankly, John, you're the one who kind of got me – sort of thinking about it and obsessed with it. I mean, I, I was aware that it was out there, and, but I hadn't spent a lot of time looking at it. And we had exchanged some emails and you asked me what I thought about it. And I hadn't really dived into it. I mean, I read the Buter comments when they originally came out and sort of pushed it aside. But um, what do you make about this movement towards um, the, the central planners trying or, 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 or making an effort to abolish cash currency from our financial system and completely converting us into a digital currency system? Well, I think part of it relates to this whole idea of negative interest rates on long bonds, financial instruments of any ilk. I mean, why would anybody accept a negative interest rate on something if they could just hold their cash? I mean, to me, it just sounds absurd. And I, and I, I think the other thing that you, it, it gives them more control if somehow they can remove cash from the system. I think it's more easy for them to monitor things and, and keep a closer tab on them. But I think it's an extraordinarily negative development. I'm just horrified by the whole process. Do you think that if, if they are able to push us into a cashless society, what effect do you, would you see that having on gold and silver? Well, I, I think eventually that uh, gold and silver will reflect. I mean, you can't get away from the essential problems in the society, which they've been covering up. And in the end, gold and silver are the true safe havens. They've somehow, because of the counterintuitive price action they've created, have got the vast majority of people failing to realize that. But I think that uh, they can put us into a cashless society, but they can't deal with the debt problem ultimately. And... At that point, I think gold and silver come to the forefront, particularly because they've been so suppressed and they are so relatively cheap. Like I was just musing on the fact that people, rich people have figured it out. I mean, they're putting their money into real things. I mean, the prices of art, diamonds, high-end real estate, et cetera, et cetera, are exploding. 
The only thing that in that ilk that is not participating, and it's actually going the opposite way, is gold and silver in their equities. I, this will all solve itself with a violent move at some point. And I don't know whether it will be initiated in the market or it will be initiated by some sort of a reset driven by China or one of the large gold holders in the world. Do you, are you seeing large uh, accounts coming into Sprott Asset? Based on what you just said, I mean, as far as people coming in to get gold and silver? We're just seeing it marginally so far. Like, I don't believe that in the West, and we deal primarily in the West, that this mindset really has taken hold at all. Where it's taken hold, as you well know, I mean, is in the East. I mean, the offtake of gold in particular, but silver too in China, India, etc. I mean, I, I can't get the numbers to work. Like, I don't know where it's all coming from. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's been my favorite question, John, for about two years now. Where is the gold and silver coming from? <laughs> well, I hope I live long enough that it's finally explained to me, silver in particular. Right? Silver drives me crazy because there is a, well, the vast majority of silver that's mined is, uh, is used. And it's, it's used in, I think, growing uses, and it's a very vital uh, material in, in, the, in the things it's being used in. And there's so little in the above-ground inventories are, as far as I can determine, relatively negligible, particularly when you put them into dollar terms. So how they've been able to sort of stretch this out in silver is an utter mystery to me. And I just, I suspect that it will lead to an explosion in the silver price that will be unfathomable to most people who don't understand what we're talking about. I you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because um, a couple of weeks ago, we, we had a chat with James Turk and he was referencing the fact that, that gold was in backwardation in the London market. And I just listened to a recent interview on the internet with him, and he also referenced silver now being in backwardation, which means that there's a greater demand for immediate delivery of physical silver than there is supply of silver. Well, that certainly is the case. I know James well, and I've got utmost respect for his thoughts, and he monitors this stuff very closely from his post over in London. And... I, I agree with them, but, but it's still somehow, even when they crush the price a dollar today, there's physical transactions going on, I gather, at the new price. Where is the silver coming from? It, it, it's a mystery to me. And J.P. Morgan just in making that announcement that they're going to take, I can't remember the number, but it's some massive amount of silver that they're adding to their, to their hoard once again, where is it coming from? I mean, well, this is odd, you know, because J.P. Morgan apparently is accumulating physical silver yes. while at the same time being the major short in paper silver. So, I mean, they would know better than anybody what the end game is. And I suspect uh, at some point we're going to run out of physical silver and the physical markets are going to take over from the paper markets and it's going to be a whole new pricing uh, environment. And I want to stay on J.P. Morgan for just a second, John, and I'd like to uh, go back to the cash list. The, how can the, the too big to jail banks give up the actual cash flow from their illicit means? Bank of America, Western Union, J.P. Morgan, and HSBC have all been fined by a court in the United States for drug money laundering. How will they be able to give up that influx of actual cash? That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I find the the whole system to be bizarre. I mean, these banks are constantly being fined for malfeasance, but the fines are a fraction of what they've ripped off and what they were doing. <laughs> yes. And I, to me, it's all part and parcel of the fact that these too big to fail banks, they've got to keep them alive as long as possible. And, uh, They'll do, I suspect, whatever is necessary. But in the end, I believe it's all going to implode because the, uh, the global banking system is so infested with derivatives and basically is probably has a massive negative uh, net worth. I mean, do you see that the banking system at this point is just nothing more than an uh, organized crime? I mean, because that's the way that I view them. Well, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't know, I, I can't say that with certainty, but there certainly appears to be, uh, it's, it, that allegation has been made by many other people, and I can't find any reason to say they don't have a good point. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 
<laughs> well said. <laughs> Very well said. Well, well let's, um, let's talk about silver, Dave. I mean, the, the, the upside in it. Like, this is, to me, why all the pain is worthwhile. Like, as long as you are not playing with the sharks in the paper market and getting cleaned out on a regular basis, you're using this opportunity to, you know, acquire inexpensive silver in some sort of a paper vehicle where you know the silver's there or in your physical possession, I think you're going to wake up in the not too distant future and you are going to be shocked at the magnitude of the price gain. I think the first target's obvious to the all-time high, which was created at the time of the Hunt uh, era, of uh, 50 bucks. But I mean, I think that's just jacks for owners. How long do you think that that's going to take? Um, well, I think John. it's all the part and parcel of the unraveling that we were talking about earlier. And I, I said that, and you know, you always have to take the uh, the plate way out and say, look, I know what the ending is going to be, but I still can't get the timing down. But it, with each passing day, because it's gone on infinitely longer than I would have ever believed, we're getting a lot closer. And you'd better be positioned because the other point I make with clients is that it's, this could be one of those situations that if you're not positioned ahead of time, you can afford to be two years early, but you can't afford to be 10 minutes late. Exactly. You know, I agree with that. And you also need to put the, the long term in perspective here. You know, I have a, a colleague of mine who loaded up on silver in the low 20s and he's, he's all up in arms and he just can't believe it's at 16. And I'm, I just say to him, well, wait a minute, you know. When I first jumped into this, you could buy all the silver you wanted at $4 an ounce. And so if, if you load it up on it and your basis is even below $10 an ounce, you've still had a pretty nice return on what is real money. Well, that's a really good point, Dave, because, I mean, if you go back to the outset of this century, the beginning of the 2000s, uh, you know, if anybody that was sort of making a shift at that point from – financial assets, most particularly stocks, into precious metals, they're not really that upset right now. What has been a major problem, though, has been the shares of the precious metal company. They have, as you know, have been absolutely devastated. And I'm actually angry with a lot of the people that run these companies. I mean, they're being absolutely taken advantage of by the system, and they won't say a word. That's, you know, that's been, we've had that problem with, with the, it's it's really the senior mining companies, John. In my experience, the the junior company managements. I mean, they're they're not vocal about it, and I think you know there's probably a you know a reason for that. But they're all aware of it, and they and they they all know what's going on. Well, they have been you know they have all have been destroyed. I mean, the exploration uh, activity in the world is coming to a halt because these people's stocks have been killed. And uh, they're out of money and they, they're out of, almost out of business. So this is a very odd thing when you think about it, because particularly with respect to gold, as we go forward, when the demand for gold accelerates, as people finally realize that paper money is going down the drain, uh, there's going to be less and less gold coming out of the ground. Because this is like, a, you know, I was out with some mining guys just two days ago, and they were saying they got a mine that's already developed. But to get it back into production because it's been mothballed, he said it'll take him the better part of three years. And in the case of a brand new mine, it'll take you somewhere to three to five years. Well, basically, there's going to be no new mines coming on to replace the attrition in the existing mines over the next five years. And so consequently, when demand picks up at the very time that supply is going to be collapsing, and it doesn't make any difference what the price is. Yeah, you know, that was actually an issue you know, at, at the start of the of this century, where you had a lot of the exploration companies had just been run out of business, and there wasn't a lot of of junior exploration going on, and and we had the same thing. And then over the next five or six years, a lot of these mines got developed and brought into production, and it, it sort of fed into the physical supply. But you're right; I mean, exploration, new exploration is basically shut down, and and all you're looking at now is a situation where you've got juniors with proved resources and hopefully the senior companies aren't going to be able to take them over right now. You know, we haven't seen a lot of, we've seen some M and a activity, but not a lot. And a lot of it is because the, the currency that these senior companies would use is so depressed in value, i.e., you know, stock for stock. 
Right. You know, but it's funny, though, Dave, because I believe there's way more levers just in the smaller entities, the, the good ones. And the last thing I want to see is some of the smaller companies that I like taken over by a major because my upside is going to be constrained by that development. I agree with that completely. And every management at a junior company that's in that position where they have a mind that's ready to go, it just needs capital to develop it. They're all terrified of that prospect because if they get an, if they get an offer, regardless of what the price is, they have to present it to the shareholders. Oh, yeah. And I mean, if some, if some prescient uh, operator of a large company realizes where this is headed and starts to become somewhat more aggressive in the near term, I think the shareholders, you know, say you bid 50 to 100% more than the current stock price, I think the people capitulate and they sell into the offer. I, I agree, and that's that's my biggest nightmare with this junior sector. I'm, I'm not worried about it ultimately recovering and going parabolic to the upside. I'm worried about what you just said. Well, yeah, I'm losing my vehicles as it's going parabolic. I know. <laughs> it's funny, you, I was out, as I said, with the smaller company that I'm a large shareholder in, and I know the guys really well. And they're paranoid about the same thing. Yeah, everyone I everyone I talk to, that's that's their biggest fear because because they don't have a choice but to take the offer to the shareholder. And a lot of these guys, a lot of these companies, you know, the CEOs themselves own between five and ten percent of the stock. No, but, I see. Yeah, they, they they have no choice but to take it to the shareholders if something like that comes along. I mean, I think right now we're fortunate that that isn't going on, and I think a lot of it is because the Barracks and the Newmonts of the world have their own issues financially that they're dealing with. You no, know, they're seriously impaired. You're right. But I, you know, I, Agnico and Gold Corps, I mean, they're in a position to make some acquisitions if they so desire. I've been wondering what's, what's holding Gold Corp back right now. I don't know. I mean, I know the guys there pretty well. I just think that there is, because the powers that be have been so successful in, you know, creating this counterintuitive price action that, it spooked everybody, including the executives of senior goal companies, and they're not sure of their own, you know, long-term future. Are any of these mining companies holding any of their stock back that you're aware of? I don't know. I'm not that I'm aware of. I mean, wouldn't it make sense, though, for them to be stockpiling, as uh, Keith Newmeyer suggested a few months ago? I mean, do you think well, that that would be a good play for, for the in particular, the primary gold and primary silver miners? I think it, particularly the silver producers, if they're basically in a position to do it. But when you've got, like, silver's interesting because 75% roughly of the production coming out of the ground comes as a byproduct of base metals. And it's, it's, so it's viewed differently by the miner than, they say, the 25% pure silver producers where I think the median cost is well through 20 right now. Right. So these guys are operating at a loss. So they really can't hold it back because they basically can, you know, they can't even meet their, they're having a hard time meeting their obligations as it is by selling all their silk. That, that's what the problem is, John and, and Rory, is that they, these, the, the, the ones who are pure silver producers, they need to generate cash just to keep their operations going. This is really sick. You know, I, 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 I hope I live long enough so I can read the obituary on this whole thing because it's going to be scathing about what we've done uh, to this society. It really is bad. I couldn't agree more. I agree with that. You've been really generous with your time, John. Can I we ask you one question it? before we go, Dave? Like, Absolutely. I, I am fascinated by this Jade Helm development in the United States. Like, What do you really think is going on? Rory, do you want to address that? I'll be happy to jump in on that. And what's there? There, it's multifaceted, John. And there are reports coming out from all over the country, including where I'm sitting right now. I had yesterday afternoon. I had two uh, army helicopters hovering over my house. Seriously. And, seriously. And oh every God. every. Uh, military movement in the United States right now falls under Jade Helm. And Jade Helm, by their own definition, is an insurgent extraction exercise. And it is it covers, that we know of, eight states, but they're training National Guard. National Guard are training here in Tennessee, which is where I'm at, okay. with, the, with the local police, National Guard, for riot control. They're also 
and that, I just posted an article about that this morning over at the Daily Coin, and there's uh, there's some reports coming out of Pravda, believe it or not, that show uh, the Marines are training also with uh, local pol- or they're training for riot control in the United States. Both of these that I just described are both training for situations for civil unrest in the United States. And Jade Helm is, like I said, by their own design, by their own word, the military's own word, is an a, uh, insurgent extraction exercise, which means to go into people's homes to get people that are on the, that are on the list and to disappear them. And, and if you put all of these things... You put that into context with the uh, National Defense Authorization Act with Section 1021 where they where the government is allowed to basically disappear people without any uh, due process, without any charges being brought against a person. And it gets to be a little terrifying. And there, there are several things, and I'm actually in the middle of writing an article uh, about this, about that aspect of it, but... Uh, Jade Helm is they're they're not they're not telling us anything, and what they are telling us, it's not even in their playbook. And when I say playbook, I'm talking about their own documents. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, there was a town, there was a community in Texas that stood up and said, "We want to know what's going on, and we don't want you on our property, on our private property." And the governor just yesterday, the governor of uh, Texas. Said, I saw it. he called out the Texas Guard. Or yes, he called out the Texas Guard and said, you are to monitor every activity <laughs> going on. And, and it's people are the people that are awake and aware to the situation are are pretty uneasy about it. I mean, it's uh, and there was a there was a colonel that came out and said specifically that the military, the U.S. military never in, the, in their history, have they trained in a territory that they were not planning on activity? Exactly, and so, so I mean, like, a, a, sort of an extension of the question: though, like, what percentage of the American populace even recognizes the name Jade Helm? Very few. My neighbor, who was a former uh, police officer in Nashville, didn't had never heard the term. I had to explain wow. everything to him. I, mean, I, I would I would say less than than five percent. If you agree. went out just to like a shopping shopping mall of America and and asked the question randomly, just did a random sample, I would say less than five percent. Um, one other aspect that I think is quite frightening about it, and if this is just just throw aside all of the internet generated conspiracy stuff. Um, and Rory referenced it, in their own documentation, it's an exercise in population assimilation where they're training the yep. special forces to assimilate into the popu- population. And so what I've concluded from that is that the powers that be are getting worried about the, the um, growth of, of dissident groups out there that are willing to take up arms and rebel against the government. And if you look at the states where they're conducting the exercise in, those states are known to be hotbeds for that type of activity. That sort of activity, absolutely. Yeah. And so what I think is, just like you were talking about the frenetic activity in the financial markets is reflecting the fact that something's blowing up behind the scenes and it might be getting out of control. I think they're worried about you know some sort of financial event that's gonna that's gonna be a huge shock to our system and I think they're worried about the population's response to that. Well, I think that is exactly my take on it. You know, I'm looking at this and I know there's sort of Baltimore and Ferguson and everything. I think that's just minor compared to what could happen if say the US dollar collapsed and I mean the whole system started to become unstuck and you've got so many private uh, people with arms in their possession. I mean, I think it could get ugly, so I can understand why they may be doing it. But it is it is not the United States I was born and spent the first eight years of my life in. I'm still in Nashville. I was born, raised here. I've left it a couple of times. And just 
the community itself has changed dramatically to the point to where the local police are not the same, the uh, government is not the same, the federal government here is completely out of control. And I think that part of what's happening also, uh, Dave and John, is that you've had the situation last year at the uh, Bundy Ranch where the Oath oh, yeah, Keepers, I remember that. Where yep. the Oath Keepers <laughs> showed up and there was a standoff. And, then, yep. and now this year you've got much smaller, not, not near the coverage, but you've had the exact same thing. The Bureau of Land Management showed up at a, at a mine in southern Oregon and the Oath Keepers are there right now as we speak, standing vigilant against the Bureau of Land Management and the the BLM has finally has once again had to back down because of local support by the authorities, by the, the local government, by the, the community, they've had to once again back down. So they know the government knows that there are people that are willing to respond immediately and react immediately to situations. And then like you'd brought up, John, the, the situation in Ferguson situation that's currently going on in Baltimore, they can see that people are not as, as afraid of the police as they think that they should be because the, of the violence, the level of violence yeah, yeah. That, has, that has been put in their yeah. face. So. There's not, a, I was just saying, sort of sit around and philosophize. There's not a lot of good reasons about being old other than it beats the alternative. <laughs> but in this, in this instance, I'm glad the greater part of my life is behind me because things were terrific in North America in the post war era. I think about that all the time, John. And I, I look at, you know, like my nephews, you know, 13 and 11. And I'm, I just, it, it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up to think about what kind of future they're going to face. It's not going to be what, we, it's certainly not going to be what we experienced. And uh, that's, I, who knows, the future is unknowable, but I don't think, I can guarantee you one thing, it's going to be infinitely more challenging than anything we'd seen in our lifetimes. I completely agree with that. Now, I've only got one more question, Dave. Sure. Who's Denver going to take in the first round tonight? <laughs> you know that's a good question i know they i think the the, the consensus view is that they're going to take a, a linebacker but i have no idea i wouldn't be surprised to see them wheel away their first round pick and 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 trade down and get more draft picks later in the draft because denver's had a lot of success they need to address offensive linemen and they and yeah. And they've had a lot of success drafting sort of wallflower players in lower rounds. So I wouldn't be surprised. Well, it's interesting. I saw a comment from one general manager. I mean, one of the worst things you should be doing is drafting for need. You should be, you know, getting more picks and drafting the best players available. Anyways, look, it's been a delight talking to you guys. And Dave, you know, maybe we should chat more often. You know, like emails are good, but I like conversations. I agree. Just, just let me know if you want to shoot me a, a contact phone number. Or I can contact. I can send you my contact phone number, and you can contact me from whenever. Absolutely. Whatever. So we'll we'll do that. Uh, in, well, in a very short time, and uh, we can sort of compare notes because I think things are going to get real interesting very soon. I, I agree. You know, a lot of people think that um, this whole thing is going to hit the wall by September. I know that. I mean, it, it, to me, it's just too many moving parts. And these guys have been good, but you can't hold it together because everything's flowing against you. Yep, I agree. You know, one of the things that one of the events that it's kind of pegged to is this idea of China. And we, we we'll have you back on again on this show. I think this was one of the topics I wanted to talk about, but it's it's a whole show in and of itself. And that's sort of the the China gold one SDR thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that's huge. And I don't, I think, the one thing that I can't answer, and it drives me crazy, like, I mean, the Westerners, that stupid to sort of let all the gold get shipped east. And then at the end, the Chinese sort of back the yuan and sort of take over the reserve currency or take over the dominant position in the SDR or whatever. And it, the impact that it has on North America is devastating. Do you see them doing that with in tandem with Russia? 
Yeah, I do. I think that basically the, the East is very unhappy with particularly the United States, but the West in general. And I think there's, you know, you can make the case that there's a more natural alliance between Russia and Germany than between Germany and the U.S., and China's making moves in that direction. And uh, there's a lot of things going on that I don't think are terribly positive for us Westerners over here. I just read an article last night, and I can't remember. Oh, I know. It was uh, Steve Stephen Lieb, and he was talking about the natural connection between Germany and China that, that doesn't get published and publicized by the mainstream media. Right. And I found that to be fascinating. And Dr. Yeah, I, I, Robert. Agree, I, I agree with Lieb. I think there's a natural, there, there's a lot of reasons, basically, to uh, sort of be changing alliance. And Dr. Paul Craig Roberts said the same thing, but he was saying that the natural alliance between Germany and Russia, actually. It, 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 that makes even more sense because they're right next door to each other. They're, they're both there, yeah. yeah. They're both there, and, and, and um, there's, there's serious economic activity that goes on between the two countries. I think that's one of the reasons Germany's been, you know, somewhat reticent about backing what the U.S. is doing in Ukraine. I agree. But it's been wonderful talking to you guys, and I'd love to do it again. We'll definitely have you back yeah. on, John. And, and um, anytime you want to have a phone conversation, or we can even do a Skype conversation. But since we've been chatting here, Silver's jumped up from about, you know, a little below 16. The, the front month future is now 1606 bid. Finally, back. <laughs> Murphy won't commit suicide. Thanks, we'll John. Touch, yes, thank and, you. Uh, it's been my pleasure, I assure you. Thank you very much, John. We certainly appreciate it. Take care, guys. Speak right. to you soon, John. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.